plan is to talk about psychosis uh, in Freud. Um, now, you know, when we read Freud's um, corpus, we see that uh, he never really provided a comprehensive account of psychosis. And it, he uh, explicitly gives us some reasons in his papers. He says that, first of all, he doesn't, didn't have um, such a, uh, a vast access to cases of psychosis, uh, mostly working in private practice. And also he said that he wasn't sure that psychoanalysis is so useful in the treatment of psychosis. And this is a big question that still is open, uh, left open today. Now, I believe that if we open uh, the Freud, uh, the work of Freud, we can identify three major perspectives uh, in his uh, approach to psychosis. Um, the one very early on in his career, uh, the late 19th century, uh, in his papers, The Neuropsychosis of Defense and Further Remarks on the Neuropsychosis of Defense. And there Freud presents the mechanism that he calls rejection, the rejection of reality. A second paradigm, I believe, can be found in the very rich paper Freud wrote about the case of Daniel Schreber called Psychoanalytic Notes on an Autobiographical Account of a Case of Paranoia. That's 1911, in his future paper on narcissism and in production, and in his paper Repression. And here Freud presents uh, psychosis in more dynamic terms, in terms of libido, and particularly he presents it as a fixation and regression to the stage of narcissism. We'll talk about this today. Finally, I think you can also identify another paradigm in he, later in Freud's career, in his papers called Neurosis and Psychosis, and the loss of reality in neurosis and psychosis, both published in 1924. And there Freud speaks of psychosis in terms of the disavowal of reality. And he also um, provides a, a certain twist, or we can say he embeds his structural model in his understanding of psychosis. So what I will try and do today is uh, speak to you about these paradigms. Hopefully we'll get to everything, um, we'll see. I might go on some tangents. Uh, this is uh, something that I just like doing. So we'll see if we, we can make everything uh, on schedule. Um, but uh, we'll start um, with the first papers and see where, where it takes us. So we start with uh, these early years in Freud's career. And you can really mark out about 14 years in his career from 1885 to 1899, where Freud uh, develops his metapsychology that concerns a group of disorders that he calls the neuropsychosis. And among these, uh, you can find neurosis and psychosis. There is a paper published in 94, 1894, as I said, called The Neuropsychosis of Defense. And there Freud states quite clearly and explicitly, as he usually does, that all neuropsychoses begin with an experience that arouses a distressing affect that the subject chooses to forget. The idea that all neuropsychosis begin with this affect that is distressing, that is unpleasurable, and the subject chooses to forget it. Now this, as I said, rings a bell for those of you that are acquainted with the mechanism of repression. So what we see at that point is that Freud says that the neuropsychosis begin with an active form of repression. And Freud says, in each of these neuropsychoses, neurosis and psychosis, repression has been shown to be the nucleus of the psychical mechanism. And in each, what has been repressed is the sexual experience in childhood. This is a quote. 
So we have this similarity between neurosis and psychosis at that point. And Freud relates both of them to something that is associated with repression. But there is a difference. In the case of neurosis, or what we might call neurotic repression, uh, and we can read Freud's later papers about that, but I'll just briefly say that what we see in repression is a detachment of this distressing affect from its accompanying idea. So the idea is detached from the affect, and the idea is pushed or inscribed in the unconscious, while the affect re remains flowing. And th this is a general description of what happens in repression. But Freud says that in psychosis, we see a special method or mechanism of repression that is peculiar to it. And here, and maybe I'll, I'll uh, paste the quote here so, for you to, to read. Hope uh, you can see it. Uh, I'll read it out loud. Um, Freud says that in psychosis, the subject rejects, and here I emphasize the word in German, verwift, comes from the word verwerfung, very important word for us here. So Freud says that the subject rejects the incompatible idea together with its affect and behaves as if the idea had never occurred to the ego at all. From the moment at which this has been successfully done, the subject is in a psychosis. So we see here this mechanism, rejection, in, Freud, in German, Verwerfung. And this is the first time that it is mentioned in Freud's corpus. And you will see that in the progression of his works, he will use different terms to describe this same mechanism at the origin of psychosis. Now, in English, it is translated to rejection. Um, I'll just mention for those of you that are acquainted with uh, the work of Jacques Lacan, and uh, Mike has mentioned that, um, well, this is the uh, psychoanalytic tradition or orientation that I belong to. So Lacan translates this Verwerfung in his seminar to foreclosure. So those of you that are acquainted with Lacan's theory of psychosis, you can see it, where he finds its inception in Freud, here in Verwerfung. But back to Freud. So what we see uh, Freud saying about this kind of psychotic rejection is that it is a much more energetic and successful kind of defense than is employed in repression or in neurotic repression. Because while well, in neurosis, in repression uh, happening in neurosis, we see a detachment of an idea from a corresponding effect, as I said. And then again, we have this weakened trace of the idea as well as an isolated effect that are left behind. But in psychotic rejection, we have a complete abolishment of all traces of the conflictual idea as well as its corresponding effect from the psyche. So this is something that leaves no trace behind. Now, Freud gives an example in this paper, and I'll briefly summarize it. Uh, he describes an analysis of his that suffers from um, a disinterest of a certain man that she's in love with. And, well, of course, this disinterest is uh, disagreeable, and Freud says that the analysis attempts to repress this conflictual idea concerning this man, but this idea persists. And Freud says, well, this renders repression ineffective. After this point, Freud says that a specific event uh, where the analysis and experiences even a stronger, an even stronger disappointment in regard to this man, she progresses into a state of even greater tension. And this brings about the rejection of the reality of his absence. So what we see here is that Freud says that at this point, the analysis passes into a state of hallucinatory confusion. And she starts hearing the voice of this man calling her and feeling his presence by her side. And Freud says, well, this marks the onset of psychosis. Now, in this example, we can see several characteristics of the mechanism of rejection. So we see that first, rejection 
is a mechanism that is superimposed on a failed repression, according to Freud. This is an interesting point. I'll come back to it later. Uh, but what we see here is that the weakened ideas, those that um, uh, succumb to repression, still persisted in the patient's reality, and only after that they were rejected. Another thing that we see in this perspective is that rejection is a more energetic form of repression. So uh, we see that rejection rejects the conflictual idea and its affect, uh, while repression only pushes the idea into the unconscious and in fact detaches the idea from its affect. And this is why Freud says that rejection is also a break from reality. It rejects a piece of the subject's psychic. The term reality is an extremely problematic one, I think, uh, today. Uh, I see many people um, using this whole notion of reality and Freud or the reality principle in, in a way that I would say is foreign to psychoanalysis. Um, I do not think that we are actually discussing here a reality in <laughs> that we can call an objective reality, a reality that is really out there uh, in, in, the, in this object, objective universe. I think that we are talking about a piece of the subject's reality, a piece of psychic reality. And again, I'll make some Lacanian comments from time to time, so bear with me and uh, I'll try and be very simple when I, I do. Um, if we think about this in a Lacanian perspective, we think about reality as symbolic reality. And in this sense, psychotic rejection disposes of a piece of the symbolic and not a piece of the objective reality. Um, this piece of the symbolic is something that's very important in terms of its organizing function uh, for one's reality. And this is why we might see the particular psychotic symptoms uh, when we uh, also observe the onset of psychosis. I'll just, just drop this here for those of you that have some acquaintance with Lacan, and I will talk about this in the next lecture in the series that will engage with Lacan directly, but what we see here in rejection in Theferfung could be in fact uh, found in Lacan as the foreclosure of the signifier of the name of the father. So I'll just put this here. We'll talk about this next time, but for those of you that are acquainted with this, this is where we see this in Freud already. So without this piece of reality, things become a little too real. In the next paper that I talk about, the further remarks on neuropsychosis of defense, Freud talks about the outcome of rejection and he talks about delusions and hallucinations. And here we have a first presentation or definition of these two elements that will be developed in later papers in a dramatic way. But at this point, we see that hallucinations are in fact a unique symptom where reality or psychic reality is restructured around the absence of what was a rejection. So in the example, we saw that, uh, let's say, whatever was um, rejected was a certain a piece of reality that had to do with the, uh, with the rejection of this man, the man rejecting the woman, right? And this was rejected. And then the hallucinations, these voices that this woman was hearing, they revolved around this absence. So Freud says that these might be images and sensations that are associated with a rejected memory, or also words said out loud that are associated with a rejected thought. So this is hallucinations, quite briefly at this point. Now, delusions are described as the projection of feelings of distrust and reproach. So Freud basically says that in neurosis, we see these feelings addressed towards the self. But in psychosis, these feelings are projected outwards towards other people. And this might remind you um, of this particular mode of psychosis called paranoia, where the subject sees the outside world as being persecutory and malevolent. 
Now, something that is important to note is that later on, Freud is going to object to this thesis, to the idea of projection in delusions, and we'll get to that. And he will provide a different formula that I will elaborate for, uh, very soon. Uh, he says, what is abolished from within reappears from without. And this might uh, ring a bell uh, to those of you that are acquainted with, um, again, with the Lacanian theory of psychosis, where Lacan says that what is foreclosed from the symbolic reappears in the real. So what we're talking about is a certain, um, let's say, libidinal cathaxis that um, is rejected and then returns um, in, in reality. Mm -hmm. um, this is an interesting way, um, by the way, I'll just make a side note, uh, to distinguish between forms of psychosis in the Lacanian orientation. Uh, because what we say in the Lacanian orientation is that in psychosis, a jouissance is, es escapes and returns in the real. Now, in order to distinguish, for instance, paranoia and schizophrenia, two forms of psychosis, uh, Eric Laurent offers to think of it as uh, two different modes of reappearance of this libido. Uh, in case of paranoia, what is rejected returns in the other, in the social world, in the world around the subject, in the TV, in the radio, in all these people around this subject, which are involved with this form of enjoyment that's tormenting the subject. In schizophrenia, we'll see this sort form of enjoyment return in the body. So in the fragmentation of the body, in these um, fantasies of the death of the body and the deterioration of the body. And I'll just say, um, those of you that maybe know my work, that I work a lot on uh, the study of autism. And in autism, we say that this enjoyment that is rejected returns in the rim, on the rim of the body. This is something that I've been working on for the past few years and I've published some paper on. So, but today we're not gonna talk about that. So this is generally the gist of this first paradigm. Again, I will only talk for about an hour today. So we'll present things and hopefully this will raise some curiosity among some of you and you can go to Freud and keep on, on reading. So we can say that this is the first paradigm that Freud provides uh, for us um, as his way to understand psychosis. Now I'm going to jump to the third paradigm, the one that is presented in 1924, because I think that these two paradigms, while they are distinct, uh, they uh, correspond uh, on many levels. I would say that we can call them uh, structural paradigms. So these are ways that Freud um, builds his metapsychology as the form of structuralism. Now, the third paradigm, and I'll briefly present it uh, today, um, it builds on the first paradigm, also on the second one, but mostly on the first one. And this is where Freud actually introduces his structural model into what he has developed in terms of the psychoneuroses. So those of you that um, might need a quick reminder, the structural model is the one that involves the ego, the id, and the superego. Uh, the topological model has to do with the conscious, pre-conscious, unconscious system. So what we see here is a development of Freud's notion of rejection, this time appearing under the guise of disavowal. Now, disavowal is a very um, interesting term in Freud because it appears several times in his teaching and in, in, different, in very different contexts. So I would say that it appears in relation to psychosis in these papers, but it also appears in relation to perversion, another 
structure of subjectivity in some other papers. But let's stick with this one. So what we see here in 1924 is that Freud rearticulates um, the uh, what we talked about in terms of rejection of reality, in terms of the ego and the id, and he says that in neurosis, what we see is a conflict between the ego and the id, whereas repression, what it does is it represses a piece of the id. And he says, in comparison, in psychosis, we see a conflict between the ego and reality. And what happens is that the subject withdraws or disavows a piece of reality. So again, neurosis, conflict between ego and id, psychosis, conflict between ego and reality. Again, this term reality, this problematic term uh, that we can read in several ways. Now, what is interesting in this paradigm is that Freud becomes more explicit in his distinction between two stages uh, in the, let's say, onset or structuration of psychosis. First stage is a stage that we can say, um, a stage that is a negative stage, uh, where a conflictual impulse is excluded or eradicated from the psyche. And then there is the second stage, which, which we can characterize as being affirmative. This is a stage where we see a compensation for that portion of reality that was damaged. And what is interesting here is that Freud says that neurosis and psychosis share the second stage, but they differ on the first stage. And here I'll paste a quote for all of you, and I'll read it out loud. Neurosis, it's just, uh, I always say, well, you don't believe me, you can read it in Freud, so here we go. Neurosis and psychosis differ from each other far more in their first introductory reaction than in the attempt at reparation which follows it. So this is very interesting. And for some of you, it might sound even anti-intuitive. What we see here is Freud concentrating on this first introductory aspect of psychosis. Um, we can say that the second one is what we know as symptom formation. Uh, Freud says that these symptoms are oriented at restoring something that was excluded because it was conflictual. Uh, I will give a much more elaborate description of this when we go back to the case of Schreber in a few minutes. Why is this argument so anti-intuitive? Because today, especially if we abide by the psychiatric uh, framework, won't. We'll usually distinguish psychosis uh, by the vast delusional world that is constructed and also we'll identify it by these elementary phenomenon that uh, we usually see uh, like hallucinations. So we would usually diagnose psychosis based on this second aspect, this second part uh, that Freud talks about. But what we see here is that Freud implies that while these might be more easily distinguished behaviorally, right, so it's, it, we can see them, we can have a list next to us and sort of say, okay, patient doesn't know what year it is, patient is hearing voices, check, etc. But Freud says that these are not sufficient in the distinction of psychosis. This is groundbreaking, I think, and Freud saying that, and also insisting that they are, these symptoms are only secondary to what can truly be characterized as the singular nature of psychosis. So basically what we see here is Freud claiming that both in neurosis and in psychosis, that this second compensatory stage uh, entails some attempt to preserve or compensate for what was excluded. And this compensation comes in the form of a compromise in what we might call a symptom. 
Now, in both cases, this compromise is only partially successful in substituting or uh, solving um, whatever happened due to the repression or rejection of this impulse that uh, had a very deep effect on the subject's reality. Now, in neurosis, the conflictual piece of reality, Freud says, is substituted by the world of fantasy, right? Uh, that is separated from the external world. And in psychosis, and this is very interesting to see here in Freud's engagement with psychosis uh, on, at, this, at this time in his teaching, Freud says that in psychosis, this world of fantasy also takes center stage because it is the storehouse from which the materials or the patterns for building the new reality are derived. So this is very interesting, uh, the fact that Freud talks about delusions and the world of fantasy taking center stage in psychosis as something that is compensatory, important, and even productive. I will get much, much more into that uh, very soon when we talk about uh, the case of Schreger that we will get to right now. So we are moving to the third paradigm that I'm going to talk about today, what we might call the second paradigm chronologically, because it appears in Freud's paper, Psychoanalytic Notes on an Autobiographical Account of a Case of Paranoia from 1911. And I'll spend more time talking about this particular paradigm because um, I feel that it is the most elaborate, it is the most comprehensive uh, among the three paradigms that uh, we'll talk about today. Now, just to um, um, give some introduction, uh, the paper revolves around uh, the autobiography of um, this um, person called Daniel Schreiber. He wrote a paper called Memoirs of My Nervous Illness. And Schreiber's case is very interesting. I won't get into its uh, exact the specifics today about his case, but I can say that he um, suffered from an onset of psychosis and uh, Freud uh, follows the several stages in this psychosis, uh, leading from um, a great suffering to finally a, a stabilization. And it's important to note that Schreber's memoirs were written for the German juridical system because he wanted to be uh, discharged from the uh, institution, from the uh, mental hospital that he was institutionalized in and had to uh, prove that that's a good idea to a court. And these memoirs were addressed to this court, so they are in a way a proof that he can leave the hospital and return to be a, um, a subject uh, in the social bond. Now, generally speaking, Schreber's psychosis is characterized by Freud as uh, manifesting in delusional uh, ideas of persecution and what is also uh, called by Freud, megalomania. Now, when Freud deals with the case of Schreber, he provides a more dynamic interpretation of psychosis. And this interpretation is rooted in Freud's theory of drive and libido. Now, I'll just make a quick comment here. Um, a comment which Lacanians usually make when talking about a theory of drive. Um, you know, um, the uh, uh, common translation of Freud made by Strachey uh, has some errors that repeat uh, in the translations. And one of the biggest errors is the fact that the word Trieb in German is translated into instinct. Now, in German, there are two different words, Trieb, which means drive and instinct, which means instinct. And they mean two completely different things. But in the English translation of this paper, you will see that the word trieb 
is translated to instinct as well. So this might be quite confusing, but in fact, Freud is not talking about instinct here. He is talking about the drive. He is libido. Now, what Freud says, uh, basically, and we'll get deeper into that, is that psychosis originates in a unique type of fixation that he calls a narcissistic fixation. And this is a hypothesis that he will develop three years later in his paper on narcissism, an introduction, and then uh, and one year later in his paper, repression. So in order to really get the full picture uh, of this uh, of this paradigm of psychosis that present is presented on in this paper on Schreber, you are advised to read these papers as well. So, what is fixation? It's a very important concept in Freud psychoanalysis. Fixation is something that happens on the level of the drive, and particularly on the level of what Freud calls primal repression. Right. Uh, Freud distinguishes between what uh, he calls uh, repression as defense or repression proper, which is the repression that we know, this uh, disjoining of the idea and the affect and the inscription of the idea in the unconscious. But Freud also says that in order for this type of repression to function, there must be a more primal repression that doesn't work on the level of ideas, but works on the level of more, uh, let's say, primitive forms of psychic inscription, which he associates with the drives, he calls them the representatives of the drives. And he says that these inscriptions, what they do in fact is they create these, um, let's say, potential psychic spaces onto which uh, repression is superimposed. So repression can function, can say, let's say this idea is inscribed here in the unconscious or not, based on primal repression. Brief, simple, there's much more to say about that. I'm very interested in this and I've written quite a lot on this, but let's keep things simpler today. So what we see is that fixation happens when drive development is stopped at a certain point in childhood and the drive then freezes or at least is set in place and persists in an unaltered manner. Now, Freud argues that the exact level of libidinal functioning on which a fixation is achieved in early childhood determines the functioning of the drive. And in this sense, it determines the structuration of the subject. So one might say that the psychotic mode of fixation presented in this paper is the structuring mechanism in psychosis, okay? And now I'm gonna give another side note. I've heard that people enjoy uh, the footnotes in, in my book and paper, so I'll make a side note in this lecture as well. Hopefully you'll enjoy it as well. So if we take into account that narcissistic fixation, this psychotic fixation, is the structuring element of psychotic rejection. Now I'm doing this, let's say, uh, uh, integration of these paradigms. So we might say that narcissistic fixation is the structuring element in psychotic rejection. We can now understand Freud's idea of a failed repression. If you remember, he said that psychotic rejection is superimposed on a failed repression. Now we can understand it better if we think of it in terms of primal repression. So in psychosis, we say then that something on the level of primal repression goes a different way, not making way for repression proper, but making way for psychotic rejection that is then superimposed on this primal repression that went awry. So this is a way to understand psychotic rejection without assuming that psychosis is an alteration in neurosis, right? Because the first thesis of a failed repression, the way that I presented it earlier, could be understood as, well, there was this perfectly neurotic patient and 
her repression didn't really function properly. And then something was rejected and she transformed into a psychotic subject. I think that this is a way, a sort of a, not a very good way to look at things. But now if we incorporate these two paradigms, we can say that it is not a repression proper that failed there, but actually primal repression. Something on the level of the drive went a different way making way for destructuration of psychosis and not of neurosis. So now we say that psychosis is a singular subjective structure. It is not a neurotic subject that turns psychotic, but someone is a, a subject is psychotic from the beginning. And what is very interesting to me at this point is that Freud insists that psychosis is distinguished not by its complexes, again, as we said earlier, but by this exact mechanism, this fixation that puts these complexes in place. And I'm going to, again, paste a quote for you that I'll read out loud. So Freud says, the distinctive character of paranoia or of dementia paranoidis must be sought for not by the nature of the complexes themselves, but by the mechanism by which the symptoms are formed or by which repression is brought about. And again, this goes against the psychiatrical model, against this idea of reality testing, against the idea that there are behavior, that behaviors and apparent symptoms must determine the diagnosis. Now, I'll give you, um, maybe I'll give this example a bit later, but what this opens up is a space for conceptualizing a form of psychosis that is not triggered. Okay, what do I mean here? I mean a subject who is psychotic, who is structured as a psychotic subject, but does not suffer from the onset of psychosis. Right? Now, this is a particular category in the Lacanian orientation that is called ordinary psychosis. This means a subject that comes to analysis to the clinic, and in fact, it is a psychotic subject, and the treatment, the analysis, has to proceed in a particular way, not in the same way that an analysis with an erotic patient will happen, but this subject does not suffer from a psychotic break. And as we will see, uh, Freud, even at his time, said that this is possible when something, uh, some important element in the, um, in the structuring of psychosis is not rejected so strongly by the subject and by culture. And I say this, from time to time, um, uh, I live in, in Berlin, and uh, Berlin is a city that's very accommodating to many, many different types of symptoms. And well, it seems to me that uh, this diagnostic category, ordinary psychosis or psychotic subjects that do not suffer from the onset of psychosis is quite prevalent here in our city. And well, one, uh, explanation is the fact that on the cultural level, on the a level of society, um, psychotic subjects find more space uh, to exist and suffer less scrutiny or pressure uh, that many times causes the onset of psychosis. I will get to that. That is what I will call uh, the contingent factor in the psychotic mechanism. But let's go back to Freud. And now we're gonna venture into murky waters. Um, because if you'll read Freud's paper on Schreber, you'll notice that he puts an emphasis on the fact that the psychotic mechanism in the case of Schreber is a unique type of repression that comes toward of homosexual wishful fantasies that are not accepted both personally and socially. Okay, you'll see that repeating in Freud's paper when he talks about Schreber's case. So let's put a pin in that and let's go to 
the paper on narcissism to try and understand why is Freud insisting on this aspect here? And then, well, after criticizing Freud, trying to maybe read Freud a bit differently in order to uh, see what is useful about this argument. So let's go back to on narcissism. And in that paper, you'll see that Freud says that libido, that the drive, goes through fundamental transmutations at an early age. Now, it starts with this mysterious autoerotism that you might have heard of, and some people confuse this with autism, which I very much go against. Um, you know, autism is many times associated with this state of aloneness, with this shielding or warding off of the exterior world. But I think this is not a proper way to look at autoerotism. If you ask me, and you can see this in Freud, autoerotism is not so much a state where there is no world, as much as it is a state where there is no ego. There is no unified ego. And Freud says this explicitly in his paper on narcissism. And he says that it is only on this stage of libidinal functioning called narcissism that the ego comes into being. Now, this is interesting as a side note. We see that the ego is preceded by the psyche. The ego cannot be equated to the psyche. And in this sense, psychoanalysis being about the psyche cannot only focus on the ego. Ego is a secondary construction, a construction that comes after uh, the uh, activation and functioning of the drive in the psyche and, and whatever this means in terms of subjectivity, as we said so far. Now, on the level of narcissism, the ego comes into being, and then also the form of libido that Freud calls ego libido comes to the fore. This is a libido that is directly invested in the ego as an object. Now, after this, mode of libidinal functioning comes object love. This is a, a, a stage or a mode that many psychoanalysts talk about very lyrically as this uh, unification with the object uh, where the, uh, we might say that narcissistic onanism can be transformed into activities that are more on the level of the preservation of the species. You might hear that I'm a little skeptical here. Um, some psychoanalysts talk about this mode as a mode where we might say that subjects are actually fucking, or a mode of normative sexuality where sex works. And to me, this is a puzzling uh, idea. And while Freud did go there, several times, he didn't always go that far. What would be more interesting for our discussion today is to understand that on the level of object love, libidinal cathaxis uh, can sometimes, let's say, traverse the investment in the ego. Uh, we can say that um, the world, or the humanized world, in its uh, continuing dimension, in a dimension of a future, can be associated with what Freud called object libido that is established in this mode of libidinal functioning. Now, in the paper on Schreber, these two modes of libidinal functioning are determined, according to Freud, uh, on the basis of the subject's genital affiliation and object of choice. And this is what brings Freud to talk about homosexuality at this level. What Freud says is that Ego libido, associated with narcissism, entails a choice of an external object with similar genitals. This is what he says in this paper, and he calls this homosexual object choice, or narcissistic object choice. On the level of object libido, Freud says that there is a sublimation of this type of object choice, of the narcissistic object choice, or homosexual object choice, transforming these um, uh, into uh, what Freud calls camaraderie, investment in the social relations, uh, the brotherhood of subjects, etc., and also to a choice of a heterosexual object. 
Now, Freud argues that commonly there is a progression between this ego libido to object libido when the subject or the drive reaches this mode of object love. But Freud says that this is not achieved by all subjects. Some subjects go through a fixation. Hmm, we talked about this, but now we understand this better. This is a fixation on the narcissistic stage. And this, these subjects that are fixated on the narcissistic stage are at the risk of developing pathologies that will undo their libidinal investments in objects in the world due to this regression of libido to the ego. So what we see in the paper on Schreber is that Freud basically argues that psychosis is rooted in a failed progression between the stage of narcissism to object love or in a fixation on the narcissistic stage. Now, in more contemporary terms, we might say that it entails a certain rejection of their reliance on the social bond, right? Uh, something that might not have to do with one's hetero or homosexual object choices, but with the organizing and domesticating cultural currents that provide the drive with its modes of um, circulation. Uh, now, Freud emphasizes homosexuality in the case of Schreber because he finds it in his delusions. Uh, Schreber builds up a fantastic delusional system which revolves around his feminization and what he calls emasculation. And Freud then identifies something on the level of this rejection of an innate homosexuality in the case of Schreber. But I suggest that we do not universalize this uh, and address all of those that read Freud in this way uh, as being uh, progressing perspectives that I think are questionable today. I think what's important to preserve from Freud is the fact that in Schreber we see Freud identifies these homosexual wishful fantasies that are rejected by Schreber himself and by culture, the culture that surrounds him. And this is what Freud emphasizes as a risk for his already structured psychosis. So it is not the fact that, that it is not homosexuality itself which is elementary here. What is fundamental, is, well, what is fundamental, and Freud stresses that in his thesis on sexuality, is that these aspects of sexuality are, you know, they are, are elementary for all subjects in childhood and in adulthood. What is important here is the fact that there is a certain rejection that contingently brings about the onset of psychosis in the case of Schreber. But we digress a little bit, so I'll bring you back uh, into our discussion uh, by posting another quote. This one is a bit longer, uh, but I'll read it as well. So Freud is saying the following, people who have not freed themselves completely from the stage of narcissism, who, that is to say, have at that point a fixation which may operate as a disposition to a later illness, are exposed to the danger that some unusually intense wave of libido, finding no other outlet, may lead to a sexualization of their social instincts and so undo the sublimation, I added here, of their narcissistic tendencies, which they had achieved in the course of their development. This result may be produced by anything that causes the libido to flow backwards, meaning that causes a regression. And here I suggest that we emphasize the contingent factor. There is something that might be a risk for pathology, for regression to the stage of narcissism, something that might manifest in symptoms of psychosis. And now we are starting to speak about the onset of psychosis. So, so far we've talked about the structuration of a psychotic subject due to a fixation. Uh, 
And now we're talking about, well, when psychosis breaks, this might be. Now, what this means, and I want to emphasize this, is that if we look at psychosis, we can identify two forms of causality. First one is a structural causality, what we talked about so far. A subject is structured as a psychotic subject. But this does not necessarily mean that we will see a psychotic break. What we see in Freud is that these people that are structured as psychotic might be at the risk of experiencing a psychotic break. So this shows you that already in Freud, we see that in addition to the structural causality, we see a contingent causality, one which is dependent on the particular circumstances in the subject's life. And when these circumstances align in a certain way, and Freud doesn't give us the exact formula in this paper, the subject is prone to a pathological regression, to what Freud called an internal catastrophe that warrants a profound internal change of the world, which Freud also called the end of the world after Schrieber. Now, I think this is one of the last quotes that I'm going to post today. Um, again, I'm saying we can see this in Freud. Freud says, the patient has withdrawn from the people in his environment and from the external world, generally the libidinal cathaxis which he has hitherto directed on to them. Thus, everything has become indifferent and irrelevant to him. The end of the world is the projection of this internal catastrophe. The subjective world has come to an end since his withdrawal of his love. This is a very interesting and elaborate description of the onset of psychosis in libidinal terms. Freud claims that in the transition from narcissism to object love, the subject establishes a multiplicity of libidinal ties with objects exterior to the ego. Right? And this carries the subject from what we might call the secluded world of narcissistic libidinal investment, ego libido, into the intersubjective domain of exterior objects and people, object libido. Now the onset of psychosis is a regression from object love, object libido, to narcissism, ego libido. And this regression entails a devastating detachment of libido from these objects and people in the world. So in other words, we see that in the onset of psychosis, the intersubjective world of objects and people is decataxed, causing the end of the world. Now, Freud emphasizes something that's very important here. And he says that it, we clearly see that psychotic subjects, even at the height of their illness, they're not totally withdrawn from the world, right? And we can look at Schreber, he's a paranoiac. He's very interested in the signs and messages that he receives as being directed to him from the world. So Freud adds something here. He says that in psychosis, the libido that has been invested in objects in the external world is not totally abandoned, but is redirected to the ego. So what we see, in other words, is that object libido is substituted with ego libido. And this means that meaning is everywhere and is all ego related. So we see delusions of persecution, hallucinations, erotomania, delusions of jealousy, all of these that have to do with objects and people in the world are all mediated through the subject, through the ego. Now, Freud calls this regression to narcissism, pathological narcissism. He calls it a narcissism superimposed on the first one. And what we see is that libido is not, it, it does not stop functioning. It is diverted from the object to the ego in a secondary form of narcissism. This is called a regression theory, and there are other uh, psychoanalysts that use this 
sort of framework in describing other uh, phenomenons, particularly autism. You can see Ogden, Mahler, Tustin all talk about a regression to a normal autistic stage. Um, and in this sense, pathological autism is a regression to a normal autistic stage. Um, yes, this is a way to look at things, but I have to say that um, some psychoanalysts, among them Tustin, for instance, Franz Tustin, abandoned the regression theory. And when we talk about psychosis, we might be better off doing that as well. Um, instead of talking about a normal a psychotic stage or something on the line of, on that line, we might say that there is a psychotic element that is fundamental to every subjectivity. So uh, this is what Lacan called paranoic knowledge as something that is intrinsic to all subjects. But we can say that psychosis is a way of doing with this knowledge, is a savoir faire of doing with this knowledge, while neurotic subjects don't have access to this way of doing. So we might look at things in this way. So we're getting to the end of this um, lecture, but I still want to talk about hallucinations and delusions as they appear in the paper from Schreber. And first of all, when uh, we talk about hallucinations, we see that Freud doesn't view them as projections now. He says that it was incorrect to say that the perception which was suppressed internally is projected outwards. This is what he said earlier, as I presented. The truth is rather, as we now see, that what was abolished internally returns from without. Now, this brings us closer to the first model, first paradigm on rejection, a rejection of an idea, its corresponding effect, and a piece of reality to which they are related. And what we have been saying is that rejection means that there is nothing existing internally anymore, right? So if there is nothing internal ex in existence, nothing can be projected outwards from the inside, right? And this is the logical argument that Freud presents here. And what he says is that when a drive impulse is rejected, it reappears from without in the guise of a hallucination, right? And this is what Lacan talks about, foreclosure, making something reappear in the real. And we will talk about this in our future sessions. We'll talk more about hallucinations. About delusions, and this will be the last topic for today, but I think, Ground, a groundbreaking perspective on psychosis here. Uh, Freud does not consider delusions in this paper on Schreber in terms of these self feelings of self-reproach that are projected to others, but now he views them as projections of narcissistic libido onto objects. And he says explicitly, and I'm, this will be the last quote, but a very important one, he says that these are in fact an attempt to reconstruct this lost object cathaxis, what he would also call an attempt at recovery. So let me paste this for everyone. Okay, so we see Freud saying, the delusional formation, which we take to be the pathological product is in reality an attempt at recovery, a process of reconstruction. So what we see here is that the onset of psychosis is a double faceted process. It begins with a regression and a depletion of libido from objects, but it is followed by an attempt to recover lost object cathaxis through delusional construction. And this brings us again to thinking about psychosis and this world of uh, delusions seriously. First and foremost, it compels us as psychoanalysts working with psychotic patients to listen carefully to the subject. And also it makes us, it, it compels us, or makes us have to see the value in the 
inner world of the subject, what we might call the signifying material that appears in the delusions, and also to see how it can be implemented in the direction of stabilization. Now, this goes against the medical model, which says, well, when we see a psychosis, we provide medication that dilutes this world, that has to get, makes the subject rid itself of his or her delusions. Now, what we see in Freud is that delusions are not measured by their relation to an objective reality. They are measured by their power to produce transmutations in the functioning of the drive. And they have a power to produce a structural alterations in the subject's relation to reality. And this is what Freud emphasizes again and again in Schreber's case. He says Schreber was forming a complete delusional system that took into account this suffering that he was experiencing. And this was the key to his recovery. Yeah, this suffering turning into delusions of persecution, finally transforming into delusions of grandeur. Now, I urge you to read the Schreber case, it's fascinating, but what you'll see there is that Schreber progresses from a, an unbearable suffering in the body, uh, and then relating this suffering to his psych psychiatrist, who he calls a soul murder, then building up this whole system of gods uh, that have to do with this suffering, and eventually finding a solution in being God's wife. Schreber finds out that he has a mission to become God's wife, and he invents this notion of emasculation, and through this notion he instates a new order of things, right? And now things are better understood as the world of libidinal objects. And what we see with this case is that with these self-made keys to the humanized world, Schreber was enable to live a life with a purpose, a life that was open to the possibility of a future. This, I think, we must take as an imperative uh, for all of us that do work with psychotic patients um, to try and see how delusions can be worked with as a stabilizing factor. Uh, the, the fact that a delusion does not comply with our personal sense of reality, even the one that we uh, share with other subjects, does not mean that it does not have a quality that is important for the subject. And in this sense, what we learn from Schreber's case and from this second paradigm of psychosis is the importance of listening to our psychotic patients, of asking them, how does this work for you? Hmm? Can this thing that is working for you here be also implemented elsewhere? This is not a matter of reality testing in the commonsensical way, but it is a testing of a reality. Can this reality function for you? Can this reality be a stable ground for you to find more satisfaction and freedom in your life? I think we'll stop here. Uh, and leave some uh, some room for questions. So I hope um, this was uh, comprehensible in some way and that you enjoyed the, the quotes as well. Um, I think we can open the stage for, for questions. Uh, Mike, what do you say? Yeah, ab absolutely. That, it's been such a wonderful talk, so thank you. Um, and we've got some lovely questions. Yes, Juliette. Please. Hi, yeah, thank you for your talk. So I'm a psychiatry resident and I work in Toronto uh, with mostly schizophrenia patients. And I'm often struck by how often their delusional content is really fixated on homosexuality, like on a fear of homosexuality or on imagined homosexual molestation and sensory experiences. Um, and I'm, I'm often not sure what to, to make of it. And it, it's really striking. And I was also wondering, um, as a second question, if Freud ever addressed the heritability of schizophrenia or the phenomenon of 
you know, families where it's clear that multiple generations have um, psychotic experiences. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Great question. Very clear question. I enjoy clear questions. They're always better uh, for me, at least. Um, so here, again, this is a suggestion that I, I made earlier, but now I'll make it more explicitly. Um, and this, is, this might be um, uh, something that comes from the Lacanian orientation in general, is to distinguish the level of content from the level of structure. Yes. Linguistically, we would say the level of the signified in comparison to the level of the signifier, right? We can see that in Freud. Freud pays a lot of attention to this level of the signifier. But how can we understand this in, in the terms that you were saying? Yes, we might see uh, the content repeating in the delusions. And as you say, these questions of homosexuality and um, what, what we assume is that, well, the fact that the subject can speak about homosexuality in these terms has something to do with the, uh, let's say, um, mean, meaningful um, database that culture provides, right? Uh, these ideas comes from, come from culture and we see also in hallucinations in psychosis that they are, they have a, a historical particularity, you know, if once upon a time it was demons and witches and it's more about aliens, etc. and the internet, of course, nobody talked about the internet before. So this is the level of content, but we can identify a structural level below that, which could comply with different forms of content, which is contingent, it relies on an historical period. Now, what we see in, in this paradigm that Freud presents uh, in terms of structure is he says that these delusions will always have something to do with a structural level that has to do with narcissism. Narcissism, not as we know it today, as uh, this very common term, narcissistic personality disorder or whatever, but we're talking about a mode of libidinal function, a libido that is directed to the ego, and more correctly here, because it is a secondary narcissism, meaning a libido that has once been directed to objects, withdrawn from objects, and then is connected to objects again via the ego. Now, the question that we ask ourselves, what content can latch on to this type of drive functioning? What we treat in an analysis is the drive. We do not treat the content. It is not so interesting for us to give the subject different stories to tell about himself. The subject will find the right story for them. Right, but what we want is a story that will comply with a change, with a transmutation on the level of drive functioning. So this is what I have to say about your first question. Your second question, which is a, an, a, another excellent question of heritability. Um, look, um, you know, uh, this, is, uh, this is something that I, I, I sort of insist on in many of my talks. And the fact that we have to be humble I mean, as psychoanalysts, uh, psychoanalysis is not um, the answer to all, to everything in the universe. Um, psychoanalysis, in other terms, is not the discourse of all discourses. It is not a meta language that can explain everything. Uh, psychoanalysis has its, um, its uh, weaknesses, its blind spots, but also has its strengths. And what I would say is that psychoanalysis is blind to the question of, uh, let's say, the physiological cause. Mm -hmm. uh, psychoanalysis is not about that. Uh, there are many other fields of science that might engage with this question of hereditability, but the psychoanalytic discourse, well, it's not useful for that. Psychoanalysis begins when the subject is structured when we are seeing a psychotic, an erotic, a perverse, or if you ask me, an autistic subject, then psychoanalysis begins. And the question is not why this happens. The, the answer psychoanalytically is a subjective choice, right? But a choice that is to be taken a bit differently than the choice of, uh, that we make in the supermarket, yes? But what we see in the beginning is the formation of a subject and then psychoanalysis asks itself, what can we do clinically, 
practically to enable this subject, which is necessarily um, suffering. I mean, for Freud or for psychoanalysis, I think there is no healthy subject. There is no subject that is at one in harmony with the universe. Um, every subject is uh, a result of a certain failure. And the question is, how can we assist this subject in living with this failure, in finding a way to maybe even make something singular of his, of, of their own particular failure, a singular thing that will fill their life with a unique type of satisfaction and, 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 and a type of freedom that, that can characterize only them. So this is what I have to say. Yes, of course there is a, her there is a hereditary factor and it is investigated by other fields, but psychoanalysis is not about that. It is about, well, we have a psychotic subject. What, how do we work with this subject? How do we facilitate the treatment? Uh, in order to bring this subject to hmm, a point where hmm, suffering is um, quite mundane and does not swallow uh, his own whole uh, reality. Um, so I hope that's, uh, that's answering your question. And I think we have two, two more questions. So. Hi, Leon. Um, thank you for this. I have a question about psychosis as it relates to dreaming. Um, I was just wondering if there's been any papers written or studies done on, like, I'm thinking if psychosis is a separate structure than like a neurosis, uh, you know, even if someone doesn't suffer a psychotic break, would their dream landscapes be different? Would the object relations in the dreams be different? Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. This this uh, another good question because. Freud says that the dream is the golden road to the unconscious, right? A dream is already an interpretation of, of something that is relevant for, for the analysis. Um, here, I'll have to rely a little bit on uh, Lacan reading Freud in order to answer your question and say that, um, well, we can start with Freud. We see already in Freud that a distinction between neurosis and psychosis would be that neurotic subjects are affected by repression. More than that, we can say that repression, repression proper, is the cause of, of neurosis. Yes. But psychotic patients, we say, do not get to the point of achieving this form of repression. Or in other words, psychotic subjects are less affected by repression. What this means is, and this is, I'm quoting Lacan here, is that the psychotic unconscious is like an open sky, a ciel ouvert. There is something that is more out on the surface uh, in terms of the psychotic unconscious. And we see that in dreams. And I'll give you an example, and maybe I'll end with that. And again, I'm, I'm inviting all of the participants here to get in touch if you have further questions please get in touch, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be very happy to discuss these things with you. What we would see in, in terms of dreams um, uh, when, when we uh, engage with psychotic uh, patients is that repression is less effective in dreams of psychotic patients. So for instance, and there's this classic example from Freud's paper on negation where the patient says, to Freud, well, I dreamt about this woman, but it is not my mother. And Freud says, well, here we see naturally that there is a repression going on. So for a psychotic, the dream will be about the mother. And then in the dream, the psychotic will in fact be having sex with the mother. For instance, this is just an example, not, not an actual clinical case. But the point is that repression will not be as strong and will be less effective in psychosis, and this will have effect on dream. Um, hello, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for this interesting presentation. I think I have two questions. So my first question would relate to what well, seems to me a bit paradoxical about repression and even more about um, rejection or foreclosure. Because it seems to me that we talk about these uh, operations as a 
attempts to ignore or to avoid some representation or some idea. And paradoxically, I mean, in order to recognize these ideas as unacceptable, like we need to recognize them first. So the subject knows what it is and then attributes a certain value of acceptable or unacceptable idea. So how can we think about this paradox here? My second question is about um, psychosis and its relation to, for example, delusions or hallucinations. So as far as I understood, what makes a subject psychotic is not the hallucination or the symptom per se, but like the place it takes within a certain structure. So would that mean that it's possible to encounter neurotic subjects with hallucinations, for example? And if it's the case, if it's possible, how could we hear the difference between a psychotic and a neurotic subject when they tell us, for example, about voices they hear? That would be my question. Thank you. Okay. Very good question today. Thank you. Um, so uh, let's begin with the first one. Um, I'll just... Um, I'll just call, I don't know if I'll say, I'll just um, disagree or um, provide you with uh, a different perspective that Freud provides us, and I'm going to send you to read it, yes? So um, you'll see that in the paper on negation, Freud explicitly says that, well, repressed content is constituted from the get-go as repressed as unconscious. It is not that something is conscious and then becomes unconscious. And I'll even say a side note here, psychoanalysis is not about making the unconscious conscious, right? Uh, it is when, when repression operates, it inscribes an element, uh, what we might call an idea in Freudian terms or a signifier in Lacanian terms, but let's call it an idea in Freudian terms. It constitutes this idea as unconscious from the get-go. Now, now you're gonna say, I don't know if you're gonna say this, but maybe you're gonna say, well, but uh, you know, if I repress something, if this is the case, then half of my reality would uh, be out of the reach of consciousness. Here, a certain distinction has to be made is the fact that when something is inscribed in the unconscious, and you'll notice that today I was trying to emphasize that. So when something is inscribed in the unconscious, it doesn't mean that it cannot be inscribed in consciousness as well, right? Uh, we have these, uh, let's say, these common examples of a, a patient saying, I'm depressed, but I don't know why, on the one hand, right? Or uh, a patient saying, well, I went to my mother's funeral, but I didn't feel anything, Right. So we can see that ideas can have something to do with repression, can be constituted as unconscious, having these relations with other unconscious elements in the unconscious. Signifiers or ideas can still exist um, consciously. This means that the unconscious is a very unique type of space. Uh, it has a very unique type of ontology. Right. Uh, I'm going here a little bit digressing into Zizek that talks about this and he says that well it's not that it is about something that exists let's say something that is conscious so this is not the unconscious and it is not something that doesn't exist right it is something in the middle in between suspended for eternity this space of eternal suspension we can associate this with the uh, Christian conception of the limbo. Right? Now you ask another question about hallucination and neurosis and psychosis. A terrific question. Uh, I would I would suggest reading a little bit from Bruce Fink about this in his paper, the the subject, the Lacanian subject. But there's a terrific example he gives there that might um, help you with this question. He says, and that's and that's very clear to me that hallucination is not a strictly psychotic phenomenon. Neurotic people hallucinate sometimes, yes. Uh, and then we have to distinguish between a hallucination in neurosis and psychosis, and Lacan provides with some tools to do that. And Fink gives an example. <laughs> the athletic patient might go to, um, I don't know, might go to church or the synagogue, or the mosque and um, pray and experience a hallucination. God talked to him. He comes to analysis and he tells his analyst, look, yesterday God talked to me. But then he would say, well, God talked to me, but I'm not sure what he wants from me. Does he want me to be his messenger? 
Is, does this really, is this really the meaning of his words? I'm not sure. On the other hand, a psychotic that will experience the same kind of hallucination might come to analysis and say to the analyst, God talked to me yesterday and I am sure that I am his messenger. Right? This is the element that would distinguish the quality of hallucination. And you are talking to me about level of symptom, not of structure. But we can identify distinction here in terms of certainty. Right? There is a certainty that is very much psychotic. What the psychotic subject is certain of is not the content of the message per se, right? Because we see psychotic pa patients wondering about the messages that they get, right? They don't, are not necessarily sure what the message means. But what is certain is that the message was conveyed for the subject and it has a meaning that is particular to him. Yes. And I would say this is a way to differentiate psychosis and neurosis on the level of hallucination. Hey, Leon. Um, so I'm coming to you with a different question here. Um, I'm very interested on how you would situate um, these different three perspectives that you describe of Freud's work. Um, on how, it, how can we situate it with contemporary takes on psychosis. So we're pretty familiar with some of these different renderings. You offered us, for example, how that first reading uh, ties up to Lacan's own approach to psychosis. But we also understand today that there's a variety of different accounts of psychosis uh, ranging from ordinary psychosis to um, notions like um, by, uh, borderline personality disorder as a ways of trying to account for different ambiguities that have arisen in the field pertaining this. I, I guess my question to you is how, how would you situate uh, the insights that you have of, offered us here from Freud in the contemporary discourse pertaining psychosis? You mean particularly in, in terms of borderline personality disorder and, and psychosis? Um, I, I, not necessarily just that, just in terms of like, how do we see these insights that Freud gave us on psychosis uh, back when? And how that has, has affected the development and, um, and formation different understandings of psychosis today. How would you situate uh, Freud's understanding in a contemporary uh, setting? Um, yes, so first of all, I'll, I'll just comment um, before uh, I answer your question that, well, today we presented um, Freud's perspective and well, that's from a long time ago. We've made some headway since, yes. Um, the question is how to read Freud uh, usefully, uh, not how to justify Freud. And I think I also gave a certain critique of Freud's sort of um, concern with, uh, particularly particular concern with homosexuality in the paper on Schreber and gave it sort of a different interpretation for today. Uh, you've mentioned Lacan and, uh, and we'll continue on that line. And I'd say that even Lacan, which started his career working with psychotic subjects, as, as some of you might know, you know, Freud started with hysteric subjects and Lacan started with psychotic subjects. His doctoral thesis concerned psychosis. And even in Lacan's teaching, we see drastic changes in the way that he uh, talks about psychosis and the clinic of psychosis. So even in, in Lacan, we see changes which are relevant um, in the later Lacan in his idea of psychosis, in his uh, engagement with the, paper, with the writings of James Joyce is very different than this time that he talks about the name of the father, etc., cetera, et cetera. At, at the beginning, Lacan was thinking that there is only one delusion that we human, we people uh, all abide by. And in this sense, the psychotic is just not abiding by this one delusion. Later on, Lacan will talk about a multiplicity of delusions. And then, well, the question of instating a singular delusion. And I was, I was touching that a little bit today. So I think that would be more relevant for uh, today's uh, clinic. What I would take from today, uh, today's lecture and sort of say, well, let's work with that today. Let's take that from Freud. If you ask me, take two things and, and work uh, work with them. The first is the distinction between a structuring a con and a contingent causality in psychosis. And in that way, we can uh, theorize and work with subjects that we 
assume are structured as psychotic, but did not suffer from an onset of psychosis. Yes, the clinic of psychosis is very much different than the clinic of neurosis. Uh, the position that the analyst takes is very different. Uh, and let's say these questions, these interpretations that might be used in cases of neurosis might be extremely harmful in cases of psychosis. And this is why this distinction between a structuring and a contingent causation is extremely important because it is important for the subjects that we see in the clinic. The second uh, conclusion that I will take from Freud today, generally from Freud metapsychology, and, and say that it's important to work with it today, goes against the notion of borderline personality disorder. Uh, what it particularly says or means is that when we have diagnostic categories, it is important that they will be singular, meaning that they will have a value of their own and in a sense not mesh up with other diagnostic categories, right? And in the Lacanian orientation, there is a very clear distinction between neurosis, perversion, psychosis, and I suggest autism, because each of these clinics is different and it's important that it will be different. What I find with the uh, notion of borderline personality disorder is a certain problematic because I think that some patients that uh, would um, be, abide by this category when we use uh, the, uh, I think it's, I'm not sure if it's still in the DSM, I think it has changed a little bit, but when we diagnose that, some patients would, when we think about it psychoanalytically, would be more accurately described as being hysteric and some other as being psychotic. And I always ask myself, you know, we, we should always ask ourselves, what is the use of a diagnostic category? And, and let me make a comment that might be a bit of a provocation. Um, I would say that these structures, these subjective structures only exist in the clinic. So in this sense, the, this notion of psychosis as a structure, neurosis as a structure, only has value when the analyst and the analysand meet in the clinic. It has value there because it helps the analyst direct the treatment, right? the treatment, not the patient. Right? This is important to know. But when the patient leaves the clinic, when the analyst goes home, I would say, you know what? I don't know if they're psychotic. I don't know if they're neurotic. I don't know if they're autistic, because outside of the clinic, these categories lose their efficacy. They lose their value. They, we, we lose them. Mm -hmm. So in this sense, I would say that the fact that Freud insists on these distinct categories is an important thing. But then I would also add, again, being more contemporary today, that maybe we we should only, uh, we should restrict ourselves to using them in terms of the relationship between analyst and analysant. Maybe we hear Shetan? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Uh, yes. actually, I, uh, I, I, I don't work in psychoanalysis, I actually work in education. And mm -hmm. I've got a sort of a, a query in, in some sense, it's a, it's a sort of simple thing. I, I, what I understood from the talk was that when the object libido fails and it exists back into the ego libido, there is a failure happening at the level of primal repression, not the repression proper. Yes. Is, is, that, is that the right way to think about this question? But if, but if that is true, if, 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 and I can understand that in Freud, there's a, there's, a, there's a point where this proper repression only happens because the attraction towards primal repression that is taking place from the proper repression, that is how the secondary repression sort of takes place. And I understand that. But how does reality get implicated into the failure of primal repression? What is this link between the failure of primal repression and the IT getting implicated into it? What, what is at stake in these, these two, two things? I, I can't get my head around right now, actually. Yeah, thank okay. you. Yes, thank you for this question. Um, I'll, I'll just say, uh, we, we've talked about uh, my book on autism and I, actually I really go deeply into this question in, in the third chapter of the book. And uh, if you're interested, yeah, I would definitely urge you to, to get it. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just say that, yes, primal repression is a mechanism that operates on the level of the drive. Yes, the drive 
is also the drive also creates an inscription on uh, in the psyche it is freud said something that is between instinct and idea it's not an idea it's not this instinct that's sort of like incomprehensible it's something in the middle and what happens on primal repression is a certain inscription that creates a fixation so a drive operates in a certain way uh, since when we talk about the subject in psychoanalytic terms we are talking in fact and even in terms of the treatment we're talking about drive functioning right it's it, it, we, uh, we we many times say to our analysis you know this is not an intellectual process you are not here to learn something intellectually what we are aiming for is for a certain familiarity a certain acquaintance with the object of psychoanalysis the heterogeneous object of psychoanalysis what freud called the unconscious but this encounter this this fa familiarity is established on the level of the body right it's not on the level of the intellect it's on the level of a change in the way that the drive operates that the way that 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 the body operates and the symptom comes into being i would say that an analysis uh, an analysis is about gaining a conviction as to this familiarity right i am familiar with this change and a change in someone someone's lives in terms of of analysis is a change in uh, drive functioning now what what i said today and I, I hope this might in some way answer your question is that primal repression for freud this is the theater this is the time where something on the level of the drive is fixated and from that day on decides and sets shapes let's say uh, the subject's um, way of enjoyment, but also suffering, right? And well, secondary repression or repression proper is a way to deal with this particular form of suffering, right? And in psychosis, there are other ways to deal with it, like this type of uh, secondary narcissism that Freud talked about, this redirecting of libido from, uh, from the ego to the outside world. When we think about the subject in this way, then the clinic can direct itself to work that revolves this. It's a very good question. What to do with the drive? Right? This is maybe the question in many, many uh, different analyses. Uh, the answer? I won't give it today, uh, but, and we'll stop here. Hmm? Thank you so much. Thank you. Leon, thank you very, very much. Um, yes. What a wonderful talk. And uh, the, what we'll do is that any of the questions left, we'll, we'll put them on the group. And uh, thank you everyone for attending. It's been, uh, been very enriching and uh, enjoy your Sunday, Sunday afternoons or evenings. Thank you very much. Great. And thank you, everybody. And thank you for the terrific questions as well. Yeah. See you very soon. <laughs>